Hi, everyone. Back again to talk a little bit about cirrhosis. So before we get started, I have a great little video here. We're not playing the whole 32 minute video, but there's a great song. And I always like to play it in the beginning of class. So let's start here. It's beginning to look a lot like cirrhosis, jaundice of the skin, from the hyperbilirubin, waste products of hemoglobin, due to lack of bile production. It's beginning to look a lot like ascites, fluid in the abdomen. From the portal hypertension, the lack of albumin, increased capillary pressure causing third space in. The liver exog recycling company with four major roles and responsibilities, detoxing ammonia and drug metabolism, storing glycogen, producing bile coag factors and albumin. Encephalopathy. With altered LOC, too much ammonia in the blood, a bright product of protein metabolism, give lactulose to aid the excretion. It's beginning to look a lot like cirrhosis. Soon we'll do a paracentesis, drain the fluid from the abdomen, and then give albumin. Bring the fluid back into the vascular spaces. Get over two hours of free liver lectures at Simple Nerve. So just a little funny slide, just to, or a little funny video, just to start off with cirrhosis. Um, I did make this. I am going to um, upload these images and the PowerPoints to um, Mesa as well for you guys. Um, but let's look over the liver functions like the video was talking about before we really dive into the assessments. I love the liver. This is probably one of my favorite um, topics to talk about because I feel as though this is really where you can connect everything. If you look at this page, and related to the whiteboard that we would be having in class, um, the whiteboard would be completely full. Um, there's just so much content, um, but I'm gonna go over and explain every single component of this um, to help you really think about each different component of um, cirrhosis and the different assessments and what we're gonna do for those assessments um, so that you can start putting the pieces to the puzzle together. So cirrhosis, um, scarring of the liver. So. Um, the liver has multiple different functions, so it detoxes ammonia, it metabolizes a lot of our medications along with our kidneys, um, it stores glycogen, uh, produces bile, has coagulation factors. Um, so our liver, starting up here at the top, metabolizes ammonia to become urea, which is a protein that our body is able to use um, within our body. So, however, when our liver is scarred and unable to function appropriately, we are not able to metabolize ammonia to, to urea. So, we will see this increase in ammonia in our circulation. So, this increase of ammonia that we see in our circulation causes us to become change of level of consciousness. It's that big encephalopathy change of level of consciousness. We're gonna see the asterixis. Um, we're going to see metabolic acidosis. Um, big thing to remember here is if our ammonia levels are elevated, we're going to knit most likely for all of our patients that have cirrhosis, see a low or no protein diet because our body is not going to metabolize the ammonia found in that protein. So we don't want to consume a lot of protein because that's going to not be broken down appropriately by our liver, which is going to cause us to become more confused or add to the confusion. So instead, 
we choose a low or a no protein diet um, to help decrease that confusion that we're going to see. <clears throat> Remember metabolic acidosis. So we're going to have a low pH, so less than 7.35. We remember that um, metabolic equal, so we're going to be looking at that bicarb, and that bicarb is going to be low as well, which is going to be less than 22. So let's just jump right into the assessment. So there are multiple different causes to cirrhosis, um, family history, um, it could be congenital deficits, uh, ETOH, typically the number one cause, um, cancer could be something. Um, any sort of masses uh, could also be a contributing factor to this. Um, if your patient has a history of ETOH, you're, you're going to see um, components that you're going to see even in like a banana bag, or you can give them orally, so your thiamine, folic acid, multivitamin, just to replete um, those deficiencies. <clears throat> Um, but let's go ahead and get started and look at what is our patient going to look like, right? So number one, we're going to see that patient have ascites. So what does ascites look like? Ascites, very round abdomen, um, very balloon-like. Um, I can actually even pull up a picture for you guys. So I'll pull up my Google and we'll Google some ascites so you can get some pictures. <laughs> balloon-like, you're going to see the skin is very taut, shiny. Um, this is a great picture of ascites. Um, so you're going to be looking out for your patient um, that may have something like this when you're assessing their abdomen. <clears throat> um, and so what is that? That is fluid built up in that peritoneal cavity. So if you jump back over to my kidney video and you look at my um, uh, section about peritoneal dialysis, you're going to be able to see that your peritoneal cavity is really surrounding a lot of your GI organs. Um, so extra fluid that builds up into that area will cause your patient to have ascites. So typically one of the reasons or one of the um, assessments that we're going to do as a nurse is we will measure that abdominal girth continuously to see if it's getting larger and larger and larger. Really one of the best ways to be able to determine if the patient has ascites and if it's worsening we can also look at intake and output as well because the fluid is coming from somewhere and it's obviously not going out and not getting, it's not going anywhere. So it's starting to build up in that peritoneal cavity. So what are we going to do about that? Um, we're going to do a paracentesis, right? So we're going to stick a needle into my uh -oh, um, abdominal. Okay, so here's a great picture. So we have our peritoneal cavity. Um, we're going to stick a needle into our peritoneal cavity, very similar to the peritoneal dialysis catheter, pretty much the same location. And then we're just going to drain it. Um, this is a one-time thing. We do a paracentesis, drain the um, fluid from the abdominal cavity, and then we'll just continue to monitor that incision site um, um, to make sure that uh, there's no sign of infection. We'll assess vitals, everything like that. Big thing to remember, if we're taking out a really large volume. So again, very similar to your thoracentesis, you may remove one to two liters um, at most from your uh, peritoneal cavity. Um, however, in some cases, there's a need to remove ex uh, extreme amount or a large amount of volume from the peritoneal cavity, especially um, for relief if the patient is having a lot of symptoms from this. So, um, we, if we are removing a significant amount of fluid, we do not want the patient to go into hypovolemic shock because of this. So we're going to give albumin or you're going to see, you're going to see um, albumin ordered post-procedure to help with that volume expansion, to help um, reduce the risk of hypovolemic shock as a result of a large volume of fluid removed in a paracentesis. But if I give albumin, um, I'm going to be promoting volume expansion and possibly increasing the risk of hypervolemia. So what am I going to see in my patient? I want to watch out and make sure that they don't have hypertension, they don't have a bounding pulse, and they don't have headaches as a result of becoming hypervolemic from this albumin given. Again, think, my body is not really functioning appropriately. 
So I'm giving fluid to help prevent hypovolemia and hypovolemic shock after the paracentesis, but I also do not want to put the patient into fluid volume overload. So sometimes you may have your patient admit, um, you may have an order for some diuretics like furosemide um, to help get rid of that extra fluid. So the albumin is helpful um, to help with um, volume expansion. However, um, we wanna make sure that this fluid that's in our uh, vascular system is taken out and the extra fluid so that we kind of can balance out the system. So sometimes you may see some diuretics like furosemide. But again, we always have to remember what labs are we gonna look out for, our BUN, our creatinine, our potassium, our sodium levels when we're giving these diuretics. We're gonna be watching our telemetry. Um, and what if this patient has renal failure in addition to everything going on, right? So most likely your patient is not going to be coming in with cirrhosis, period. You will be seeing test questions with your patient coming in with cirrhosis, period. So please make sure that you're remembering the difference between test and uh, clinical. But in test world, your patient will come in with cirrhosis, period. In clinical world, your patient's going to come in with uh, a can of worms of situations, right? So maybe we'll have some kidney failure, maybe we'll have some cardiac damage. Um, we may have uh, some splenomegaly, we may have some uh, change of level of consciousness, maybe some esophageal varices. We're going to see a combination of these things. In addition, we may see this renal failure. So thinking back and looking back on, does my patient need hemodialysis? Maybe they are going to have peritoneal dialysis. Um, in addition, because of the cirrhosis and now the uh, chronic kidney disease. So just kind of thinking about that, um, especially then if we're giving diuretics, is it appropriate? Is the amount appropriate? Is this going to become nephrotoxic to the kidneys? Um, so just being aware and cautious about that for your ascites and your paracentesis. Moving on, so we talked about ascites, so let's check that one off. Um, let's talk a little bit about jaundice. So jaundice, yellowing of the skin, you're also going to see the yellowing of the sclera, right? So the whites of your eyes become yellow. Um, sometimes you can see it in your oral mucosa, you can see some yellowing. Um, the jaundice is typically because of that high bilirubin level. So normal is 0 0.3 to 1. Um, typically they say anything over like 15, 20 um, is when it's starting to become a concern. A lot of times we're seeing elevated bilirubin levels of like 20 or higher um, is when you're going to actually start seeing that jaundice. Um, so just monitoring and identifying that. Moving on to splenomegaly. So we're going to see most likely an enlarged spleen, right? So up here I have in purple my healthy size spleen. Um, and then here in this yellow beige color is a little enlargement. And then the massive is going to be very large. This is something that can be um, palpated. So we're, again, this is one of the reasons we stopped doing um, deep palpation as nurses, because if for some reason this patient had splenomegaly and we were pressing or maybe um, appendicitis or something, and we were pressing and we just were unfamiliar that that was going on, we could initiate something. So really have moved away from, um, deep palpation, but that is one of the thing, um, one of the assessments that you can do to identify how large your spleen is. Um, symptoms, abdominal discomfort, poor appetite. Um, and again, right here, if you look, infections, cancers, portal hypertension, anemia, again, what does our kidney or what does our liver do? Our liver is uh, functions as coagulation. So again, um, Inflammatory diseases, metabolic diseases, again, everywhere you see liver, liver, and liver. So liver and spleen go hand in hand. So just making sure that you're looking out for that as well. Um, so here's that splenomegaly. Um, <clears throat> so um, again, we were just talking about bleeding and anemia. So sometimes with the splenomegaly, you may see um, low platelets. Again, um, your spleen is a big component in this along with your um, liver. So you may see that low platelet count. What is normal, what's a normal platelet count? We have 145,000 to 450,000. 
give or take, again, your resources may give a little bit different of a number, um, but you're going to see those platelets less than 145 to 150 or 145 to 150,000. Um, and you're going to see that petechiae. Um, sometimes you may also see a term called spider angioma, right? So you're going to see that blotchy, those little um, broken blood vessels um, due to the risk of bleeding. So we're again, right here, bleeding, we're gonna be watching their H and H, looking out for any bleeding um, symptoms that could be relating to this patient having splenomegaly. Portal hypertension. So we have our portal right in our liver. Um, and it when we have excessive amount of high blood pressure and vasoconstriction in our liver or our portal vein, this is going to help reduce uh, perfusion. Um, a lot of times you may see um, some low albumin levels with patients that have portal hypertension. Normal albumin is 3.5 to 5. So again, you would see that less than 3.5. Try to remember that albumin, the albumin value is the same as the potassium value. Um, with the hypertension in the portal vein, you're seeing uh, vasoconstriction, which is going to increase the pressure and it's going to cause the liver to not be able to function appropriately. So we're going to see that third spacing, really looking at your patient that has ascites. These are really connecting, right? So you're really seeing the portal hypertension and the ascites and they're really kind of going hand in hand. So what are we going to do about this third spacing? We're going to get rid of it um, by doing a paracentesis. Um, and again, just remembering all the things, the same things, if we're taking off a large amount of volume, I may have to give some albumin, um, but I'm gonna watch out for uh, hypervolemia, maybe give some diuretic, uh, watch out if they have renal failure. In addition uh, to really ascites and the portal hypertension due to the third spacing, is we have an excessive amount of pressure um, in our abdominal area. And this can put a lot of pressure on our internal organs to kind of shift them back and up, which will put a lot of pressure on our lungs and our lungs will not be able to perfuse and um, expand as uh, the large amount of volume that they typically are used to. So you may have your patient coming in with excessive amounts of shortness of breath in relation to uh, the third spacing and ascites. So we want to make sure as a nurse we're doing our lung assessment because I wanna make sure that they don't have any fluid that's now you know, coming out of the, you know, we have all this third spacing. Is this third spacing going into our pleural cavity as well? Do we have some pleural effusions or buildup? Do we have some pulmonary edema? Again, we have fluid in excess because of this situation. So fluid in excess is going to back up into the heart, back up into the lungs, back up into the kidneys, which is why all of these really just go hand in hand. So. I want to make sure I don't have any uh, pulmonary edema as well. So you don't want to hear any crackles, rails, anything like that. That would be indicative of the patient having some fluid overload. Uh, maybe I would do a chest x-ray, check the oxygen, their SpO2. Um, sometimes your patients, you may see some respiratory alkalosis. They're really having, all, they're, um, they're in pain, right? This, thinking about that large, tall, shiny abdomen and putting so much pressure on all of your organs is going to be painful. So respiratory alkalosis, maybe some hyperventilating. Um, we're not necessarily thinking of our respiratory rate is less than eight and we need to intubate in this case. Although that may be possible if this patient maybe is uh, having some encephalopathy and you know they're not really, uh, they have some change of level of consciousness and we may see some um, decrease in respirations. However, that's not typically the first thing that we're going to see. We're going to see maybe a hyperventilating patient with a lot of stuff going on um, and a lot of um, our ABGs completely off. So we may see our patients needing to be intubated um, at this point as well, just to make sure that we can manage them and we can control them so that we can fix the problem and then we can move on and um, stabilize them. Um, also this portal hypertension, right? So this excess vasoconstriction in that portal vein in our liver um, contributes to the reason why we're most likely seeing these esophageal varices as well. So we have excessive amount of vasoconstriction right on up to all of our um, veins in our body. 
um, causing our patient to have what you, some people may have heard of because of this increased pressure and third spacing, esophageal varices, right? So I have um, areas in my throat or in my esophagus that are getting larger and larger and larger because of this vasoconstriction, putting them at risk for bleeding. So we do not want these esophageal varices to rupture. Um, that is the worst case scenario. However, you're not necessarily going to be seeing any symptoms until they rupture. So if you start seeing things like uh, hematemesis or you know, vomiting blood, uh, dark tarry stools, dizziness, most likely you're going to initiate, you know, what am I gonna do with a patient that has esophageal varices? I'm gonna monitor them, monitor their blood pressure, monitor their level of consciousness, make sure that they're not bleeding. We're gonna look at labs, all the typical things that you're doing. We've really identified a very common um, group of assessments uh, that we're doing on all these patients. But we could do something like a capsule endoscopy, right? So they can swallow a capsule and we can, as a video camera, we can take a look. Or we can do an EGD and actually go down there and esopho gastro duodenoscopy. So deeper than an um, endoscopy so that I can really get down and look at what is going on and what's the cause of this. Most of the time, your patient is going to be started on IV octreotide. So this medication is something that helps reduce that portal venous pressure, which helps reduce the risk of that portal hyper, uh, the portal hypertension and reducing the risk of these varices from starting to bleed. Um, we also may see the combination of a beta blocker, right? So OLOL, um, make sure that they're not drinking alcohol. This patient is in the hospital. So unless someone's making them an alcohol, they're not drinking any alcohol, but it's just something to be mindful of because um, the alcohol, the fact is the alcohol is going to cause that vasoconstriction and going to prevent this medication from working appropriately. So we do a capsule endoscopy or an EGD. Um, and we identify that, yes, we confirm this patient has esophageal varices and we need to um, do something about this. So we can do something called esophageal banding or variceal band ligation. Um, a little less invasive. This is, um, we put bands around the um, esophageal varices to help prevent them from bleeding. So basically you take like rubber bands, think of it like this, take a bunch of rubber bands, and just kind of wrap it up, right? It's a really temporary Band-Aid, but it's going to give another layer so that those, um, so that they do not rupture um, and they have you know, more strength on the outside uh, from preventing them from rupturing. <clears throat> we also have a TIPS procedure, a transjugular intrahepatic portosystemic shunt. So what this is, is it's a tube in your liver into your portal vein to help um, reduce that portal hypertension. Um, and those varices. So I have a nice picture here. Um, so we have, here's our esophageal varices. You can kind of see them, they're ballooning. Um, they're getting larger. Um, <clears throat> we wanna make sure that they're not bleeding. So we're gonna watch their H and H. Like I said, we're gonna give, administer some octreotide um, to help reduce that uh, portal venous pressure, acts as a vasodilator, um, reducing the risk of bleeding. We're gonna do an endoscopy, like I said, either an EGD or an endoscopy or a capsule endoscopy to identify and diagnose if there's bleeding. Um, we can give some IV antibiotics to help prevent them from bleeding. Um, typically you're seeing um, ceftriaxone, another couple of medications that you'll see when I talk about um, encephalopathy is metronidazole or flagyl. So that's another medication that you may see um, to help prevent this. Down here, um, we have the TIPS procedure, um, which is basically, like I said, a shunt. Um, it's a small tube that gets placed to help prevent uh, and um, uh, assist that portal vein. We also have something called a balloon tamponade. Think of it as basically a, just a balloon that's kind of opening up in our esophagus um, and putting just enough pressure on the varices to help preventing that, prevent them from bleeding. So we're stabilizing them and keeping them in place until we're able to do an endoscopy. Um, again, this would be a patient that's intubated um, and most likely in the ICU. You know, they're going to be in the ICU.
and you know we get uh portal hypertension we see the esophageal varices we maybe have to do a procedure for that we've talked about ascites we've talked about jaundice we talked about sweetomegaly in addition to all of this again thinking about drug metabolite metabolism glycogen storage you know we start seeing this muscle wasting and this weight loss um, unexplained, unreally unsure of what's really going on. Um, and we move into seeing the actual encephalopathy. So like we were talking about earlier, right, our liver breaks down ammonia into urea. Um, but however, when you're, you have cirrhosis, your liver is incapable of doing this. So that's why that buildup of ammonia is causing us to become confused, significantly, significantly confused. You may see encephalopathy with things like renal failure. You may also see it with patients that have um, excess amount of CO2 in their blood. Um, you may see some encephalopathy, uh, but this is cirrhosis related. So due to the excess amount of ammonia, we see our patient becoming confused, change of level of consciousness, the asterisks um, due to that elevated pneumonia or ammonia. So we can give them um, lactulose to get rid of that ammonia. Um, just pushing that into the cells and getting rid of that. Again, we want to watch out though, very, uh, for that electrolyte imbalance. Biggest one with lactulose is your decreased potassium or hypokalemia. Um, we're causing our patient to have excessive amount of diarrhea. So we want to make sure that we're uh, monitoring their telemetry. Um, in addition to the encephalopathy, thinking about this patient as a whole, most likely they um, are hypertensive and they have an excess amount of fluid uh, building up in their hypervolemics. We wanna watch out over here for the increased intracranial pressures. We have not really talked about this yet. We will be talking about this this semester. Um, the medications that we can give, um, osmotic diuretics, so mannitol to help reduce that pressure, reduce that intracranial pressures. We wanna sit them upright. Um, try to help stimulate and let that uh, fluid uh, gravity do its job and help reduce that fluid, reducing the stimulation. So nice low light, um, uh, quiet room, um, clumping or, you know, doing your activities in periods and giving them rest periods. In addition to this patient as encephalopathy, we're going to be doing things like neurochecks, probably Glasgow coma scales. Um, and again, we're going to be giving them antibiotics as well. So two big antibiotics we're giving a lot of times, rifaximin and um, metronidazole. So those are the common medications that you're most likely going to see um, for these patients. Thinking about just looking at some medications that could potentially put your patient at risk for cirrhosis, um, NSAIDs, statins, our liver is huge in creating or um, uh, metabolizing and producing cholesterol. So um, those statins that are helping reduce that cholesterol um, work hand in hand with our liver. Um, a lot of our antibiotics, gluconazole, uh, sulfamide, um, acetaminophen in excessive amounts. Um, I believe it's greater than like 4,000 milligrams of acetaminophen can be um, liver toxic, carbamazepine, phenytoin. So just looking at some medications, again, nothing to really memorize, but just being aware of these medications and how these medications could put the patient, put your patient at risk for cirrhosis. Otherwise, I'm just taking a look at my book just to make sure I've got and I've covered everything for you guys. If you have any questions at all about cirrhosis or any of the components here, please feel free to reach out to me. Um, otherwise, thank you for your time.